So Gary Lineker will be back on our screens next week. After three days of turmoil and a mutiny at Match of the Day, the BBC has quickly reinstated its highest paid star. The corporations apologise to viewers for the crisis. Well, I'm very sorry for the disruption today. It's been a difficult day and I'm sorry that audiences have been affected and they haven't got uh, the programming. And says it will carry out an independent review into its guidelines on the use of social media. Sky Sports News also understands that the BBC apologised privately to Gary Lineker. Have you come to any sort of agreement with the BBC yet, Mr Lineker? I can't say anything at the moment, sorry. We had any discussions with them overnight and things like that. I just said I can't say anything. But all this has come at what cost? In its pursuit of impartiality, some say the BBC has called into question its own independence. So how did the BBC get into this mess? And can it ever get it right? I'm Sally Lockwood, in for Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily. Well, I mean, the BBC is never on Sky. The BBC has been around for 100 years and has a collection of wounds that would you know, stretch from here around the globe. I mean, you know, if you're as big a broadcaster as the BBC, you're going to have all kinds of things happen. And some of them are unquestionably embarrassing. Uh, and one would rather wish they hadn't happened. But the BBC is there after 100 years for a reason. It's been an embarrassment, but I think there's a way forward. And I'm optimistic that something at the end of this will be resolved. This is Mark Damazem. He has a vast knowledge of the inner workings of the BBC. He was formerly the boss of Radio 4, and before that, he was the head of current affairs, head of political programmes, and editor of its television news. We're going to be talking to him later about where the BBC goes from here. But first, this row over Gary Lineker's tweets has become a huge deal because it's made people think twice about the BBC's independence and its role in politics. When Tim Davey became the BBC's Director General, he made impartiality the corporation's core value. We are in the BBC and myself are absolutely driven by a passion for impartiality, not left, right or pandering to a particular party. I think at the moment it's a ridiculously big crisis. I mean, for something to lead the news day in, day out, right across the media, on the BBC and, and everywhere else, is, uh, is absolutely bizarre. Suzanne Franks is a media professor at City University. And before that, she was a BBC News producer. To, you know, to immediately uh, react and uh, cancel Match of the Day or cancel Gary Lineker um, is, is, is extraordinary. I mean, I, I can't see that another organisation would have, would have... I mean, it's like a panic, panic attack. Um, I don't see that another organisation would have done that. We have to give it to the BBC that, that they have had this story running at the top of their news bulletins. They've scrutinised themselves uh, in recent days. They've also, you know, had phone-ins about it on, on Five Live. But do you think they also kind of got themselves into a pickle over this Gary Lineker issue and impartiality? Well, they've completely got themselves into a pickle. And personally, I, I would have um, also challenged the news judgments that, that puts this at the top of the bulletin. Um, day. I mean, not, not just for one day, but sort of day after day last week. Explain to us, if, if you can, just why it is so important for the BBC to be perceived as impartial. Well, I, I think to, to be able to kind of sustain your your crucial reputation as a public service broadcaster as the the broadcasting you know on behalf of the public to the public paid for by the public um, you have to be seen to represent all points of view and to be fair between different different points of view uh, but that that's really predominantly something that that matters in in news and current affairs and it's very very important there that round the world the BBC is is seen as seen as impartial and that's how it's kind of value and reputation you know over a hundred years has been sustained but I think what we're talking about here is is slightly different because we're, we're talking about a, a sports reporter um, and if, if he was to be um, partial between I suppose different football teams then we'd think oh well, you know that 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 that's not really acceptable but 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 we're not talking about sport we're, we're talking about his personal twitter account um just talking about the the affairs of the day which is something else Suzanne if Gary Lineker had expressed anti-migrant views on twitter in line with the government's policy potentially do you think we'd have seen the same fallout no, I mean, as long as they were you know, sort of when you talk about anti-migrant views, you know, no, if he if he talked about, you know, that we need to curb asylum seeking or, some, or something like that, um, because I, th I think the um, I think the BBC is, you know, it, it, at the moment, more than usually, very, very nervous about uh, 
what what the government is is saying and what the government thinks of them. Does the BBC sometimes get it wrong by being so bogged down in trying to be impartial? The David Attenborough series, for example, you know, an episode focused on the destruction of Britain's nature that has reportedly been pulled because it could have risked a backlash from the right wing press and and Tory politicians. And, And many would say you can't be impartial when it comes to issues like climate change impartiality is also about calling out things that aren't true rather than giving each side the airtime to say what they like. Well, I think climate change is a really good example because um, a few years ago, uh, climate change was held up as a, you know, it's an issue like every other and we need to do on the one hand and on on the other. Um, And the former um, uh, cabinet minister, Nigel Lawson, who's a well-known climate sceptic, was so many times on the BBC voicing his views, whereas thousands of scientists were voicing the other side. And the BBC was trying to maintain this um, this, this sort of what, what turned out to be a false balance. And then there was an inquiry into this and they did reach the judgment, which which you've just referred to, that, you know, you can't be... Um, neutral about about things climate change is not something you can be neutral about so that that is quite interesting that uh, that the bbc has you know they did take a view and then they they very much changed their view so uh, i'm not quite sure if they pulled this episode i mean i, th- I think that what they're saying now is this episode was never going to be broadcast it was always just going to be on iPlayer. So. bbc denied that the episode was yes. ever going to be aired anyway <laughs> yes just lastly formerly a bbc insider looking in from the outside now suzanne what does the BBC need to do? I think it needs to have the courage of its convictions. Um, you know, they, they shouldn't have... I mean, basically, that what happened last week was driven by Daily Mail headlines. You know, there were the Daily Mail headlines two or three days running and somebody must have panicked in, in, inside the BBC. And they, they need to have the courage of their convictions as a world-renowned, phenomenal, fantastic public service broadcaster um, that has, you know, has got this this amazing reputation over, over a century and that they, they need to just stick, stick to their convictions and not worry about what uh, uh, a right-wing um, newspaper and a right-wing um, MPs are, are, are muttering about. So Suzanne thinks the BBC needs to be bolder and less influenced by criticism. Hard in this case when Gary Lineker's suspension from Match of the Day resulted in a boycott by sports pundits. But Mark Damazer, who was previously head of Radio 4 and a number of other BBC news departments, is philosophical about the Lineker affair. He's seen much bigger crises at the corporation come and go. I think the Gary Lineker saga, Their Finest Hour, is a book unlikely to be written about this. I don't think it's up there with Martin Bashir and Princess Diana or the BBC and the Blair government about weapons of mass destruction or uh, Jimmy Savile being a sexual predator whilst being allegedly some kind of star on the BBC. So I don't think it's anything like those. It's not their finest hour, but I I think that Tim Davey was faced with a series of unpalatable choices and actually has come out with what seems to me to be the most sensible outcome. But this is, of course, nothing new. I mean, we've seen other stars expressing views before. Andrew Neil, Alan Sugar, Mm. uh, who was very anti-Jeremy Corbyn. You had Prue Leith, who supported Brexit. But... The concern is that it's perceived the BBC reacted in the way they did, pulling Gary Lineker off air because they bowed to pressure from government ministers. And that's the problem, isn't it? Why pull Why pull Gary Lineker off air and not discipline the other stars I've mentioned? Now look, Alan Sugar, this guideline that we're talking about is only 2020. And you're quite right that some of the tweets that Alan Sugar had offered to the nation before 2020, would have fallen the wrong side of this guideline, in my view. But as it turns out, uh, I'm told, and you know, I haven't done a forensic examination of Sugarland, but I'm told that since 2020 and this guideline was introduced, he's actually turned it down. But Andrew Neil, I mean, it is a very odd case. It's a very, very few people on either the left or the right think that Andrew Neil was anything other than scrupulously impartial, as well as being well informed on air. And that's the get out. It's not very satisfactory, by the way. I can see entirely the point that you make. Uh, It's inconsistent and imperfect. And you're right. But it is an explanation. He was amazing on air. Gary doesn't have the ability to be impartial on air about news and current affairs. That's not what he's paid for. He's just a consummate sports presenter. So the same doesn't apply. But the BBC has another problem, doesn't it? In that it has staff working the BBC with, with 
political association. So you've got Richard Sharp, the chairman, who donated to the Tories. The director general, Tim Davey, who once stood to be a local councillor for the Conservatives. And then the formerly editor of political programming, Robbie Gibb, who worked for Theresa May. It doesn't invoke a lot of trust, does it? And public confidence is the BBC's currency. Well, you're right about that. Public confidence is the currency, but I mean, each of those cases is slightly different. In and of itself, Richard Sharp's connections with the Conservative Party is not what is damaging in Richard Sharp's current position, I'd say. Uh, Tim Davey, uh, I mean, we're talking about something 30 years ago, and I worked with Tim, uh, and I can say that I never had a scintilla of doubt about his commitment to the independence and impartiality of the BBC, not at all. Robbie Gibb, um, the BBC has had people with political, very obvious political flavouring on board. The question is how he exercises his role and his judgment and his influence. If we, if we just look to the, the current controversy surrounding Richard Sharp, who's chairman and, and, you know, reports that he helped facilitate a loan for Boris Johnson, you know, the chairman of the BBC has, has almost always been a political appointment. The question is, should it be? Probably not. Um, I'd rather not. Uh, I think it's quite uh, interesting to construct a system which takes you out of the final choice being made by Downing Street. I would be interested in such a system. So the current system, which has been going on for a long, long time, and as you rightly say, has produced chairs of more than one political party, nevertheless, is always going to give you a perception problem, even when the job is done as scrupulously impartially as Chris Patton did it, as Rona Fairhead did it, who was another person I think who was thought to have conservative leanings probably did, as Gavin Davis did, as Michael Lyons did, it is always going to be a question in people's minds. So I think that the construction of a system that takes number 10 out of it would be a good thing. Now, Gary Lineker has been reinstated. How do you think those ministers who are critical of his tweets will react? And how do you think the right-wing press will react? So look, some Conservative MPs are furious and will have wanted the BBC to do something pretty drastic to Gary Lineker. That's always going to be the case. But I would say on the whole that some of the reaction to what's happened here from the right has not been full on culture wars. I mean, in terms of the way the right wing press see it, well, um, let's see. Um, I mean, it's a very good story for them, um, uh, apart from anything else, and you shouldn't underestimate that. One of the things that the BBC does and what you pay your licence fee for, you pay for all the programmes and the online content uh, and all of that, and you also pay for the um, national entertainment that it gives when the BBC gets into a bit of a mess. I mean, that's not part of the licence fee formally, but honestly, it's such a national talking point that everybody joins in. So from the point of view of the newspapers, it makes tremendous copy, get that. And it's unlikely that the Mail and the Telegraph will ever be sympathetic to the BBC, almost no matter what it does. Uh, the question is, you're faced with the dilemma that Tim Davey has, trying to run an impartial news organisation, which, by the way, is pretty good. In fact, in my view, exceptionally good at providing impartial news and current affairs to its many audiences. And you've got to wrestle with this rather tricky problem, which is what do you do about people who aren't in news, who nevertheless want to express themselves very strongly on Twitter? Does it or does it not? contaminate the BBC brand overall? And that sounds like uh, the exam question. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure the Daily Mail feels that it's got an answer and the Telegraph's got an answer and the Guardian's got an answer and the Times has got an answer. They're not the same answer. It's quite difficult, actually, to get it all sorted. Uh, and that's what Tim's got to do. They've got this independent person coming in from outside. At this point, I don't know who. And we'll see what they come out with at the end. And they may well choose to stick to the current guideline or they may alter it, or they may abolish it. And then Gary Lineker can make a decision about whether or not he feels that he can stay in the BBC and exercise his conscience and his willingness to contribute to the national debate to his 8.9 million Twitter followers. The far bigger crisis for the BBC, perhaps, in the last week, is that it's called into question their independence. What's your take on all of that? Yeah, not for the first time and not for the last time. Look, the BBC is surrounded by political debate. The governments of the day have never particularly liked the BBC. And the BBC, despite everybody often perceiving that it's got this weakness or that weakness, on the whole, I think the BBC has done a pretty splendid job uh, in recent years in being able to ward off these kind of pressures. But if you have a strong opinion in one direction or another of a strong flavour, you're very often going to end up being suspicious of where the BBC stands. And looking back now, at you know, with your depth of um, experience, do you think the BBC has compromised um, in instances when it comes to its independence due to this government pressure 
that you describe? Yeah, well, I mean, you go right back to the beginning. This shows you there was no golden age, by the way. And it's an important point because some people, albeit of the older uh, kind of generation, think, oh, you know, Lord Reith or World War II. And, you know, once the BBC was noble and scrupulously impartial. Uh, to heck with that. I mean, if you go back to Lord Reith, he was many things. He was a monster. He had one particular genius, which was to come up with the idea that, you know, the BBC would be owned by the public and not by shareholders and all that sort of stuff. Brilliant. I'm internally grateful to him for that. But, you know, Lord Reith was absolutely not an impartial head of the BBC. Thank you very much. Uh, and the BBC did a very good job in World War II, but I can tell you that they were treading all over J.P. Priestley's talks and it wasn't as scrupulous as some people might think. Uh, and on and on it goes. So the notion there was a golden age of impartiality and that in some way now the BBC is being weak and feeble, feeble in, in the teeth of opposing political forces is not true. I think the BBC is better at all of this than it used to be the case. And I'm not saying it doesn't make the occasion impartiality error. I can think of some, some one or two moments in the Brexit debate where I thought economists who were making the pro-Brexit case weren't sufficiently challenged and so on and so forth. So we can all have our little moments and our little gripes. But I'm asking you know, the audience to this podcast to step back a bit and take a rounded view. And my rounded view is both as producer and consumer, it does an incredibly good job for the vast majority of its audiences for the vast majority of the time. Now, they've announced this independent review uh, to look at social media guidelines. What what should that review look like, in your opinion, and who should be overseeing it? My, my view is that quite a lot of people should be spoken to. Um, it's obviously not going to be just Gary uh, and Tim Davey. I mean, I think that the BBC's presenters, both freelance presenters and non-freelance presenters, are going to be worth listening to. Uh, and I think both inside news and not news ought to be listened to. I think that Ofcom, the regulator, needs to be kept in the loop. And I would say that the audience needs to be listened to. Now, in saying that, the audience is not a lump of one thing. The audience will point in many different directions. And I don't think that's a bad thing either, because it will show everybody the complexity of the issue. I'm not one of those who thinks it's simple. When I was on the BBC Trust, we commissioned reasonably regularly audience surveys to find out about audience views of various things, including, by the way, impartiality, but many other things. And we were able to make sense of it. I mean, we employed the appropriate companies to do it, opinion poll companies, focus groups companies, qualitative research companies, and we made some sense of it, even though not everybody agreed. So I hope that the audience is involved in all of this, uh, because in the end, the exam question, as I suggested at the beginning of trying to answer, is whether tweets, which are not part of the BBC's output, not done by a BBC news presenter or reporter, but very, very strongly expressed, do or do not harm the BBC's overall ability to be an impartial broadcaster, either in reality or the perception thereof. Now, that's the question. Not so easy to answer. So let the audience come into this and see what they make of it. Publish all of that with all its messiness, because it won't be straightforward. And then somebody has to grip it. It'll be the BBC and take a view about this guideline, about whether they want to keep it, change it or abolish it. And then Gary Lineker and the BBC sit down and decide whether that's good enough for them to go on. When it comes to the BBC's impartiality and independence, can it ever get it right? On air, which is what counts for its audiences, who are its owners, all of you who pay the licence fee, it does get it right on an extremely consistent basis across many channels pretty well all the time. That's my view. It may not be you know, everybody's view. I understand that. But that is what I think. By the way, I think it makes mistakes in impartiality from time to time as well. And on more than one side, as I tried to indicate earlier, the political environment is always testing both from the left and the right. I mean, you know, Boris Johnson and, uh, you know, Liz Truss for the brief time that she was there and, you know, various others before and doubtless after have made life as complicated as they can for the BBC whilst professing their undying admiration and love for a treasured national institution. I mean, Boris Johnson would say on Tuesday, oh, you know, the BBC, the most valued treasured national institution. And on Wednesday, he would try to do all that he could to raise doubts about the BBC's impartiality. And he wasn't doing that because of his love of impartiality. He was doing it because it was in his interest. So it's a pretty difficult environment. And by the way, you know, Labour governments, all the rest of it, that's just the, the world in which the BBC lives. But for its audiences, the answer to your question is, yeah, I think it can get it right and does get it right most of the time. My thanks to Mark Damazer and Professor Susan Franks and to you for listening to the Sky News Daily with me, Sally Lockwood. This episode was produced by Emma Ray Woodhouse with Alex Eden. Our editor is Philly Beaumont. <laughs>